Act One of Lulu Two, Pandora's Box by Frank Vedekind, translated by Samuel Atkins Elliot Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters, Lulu, read by Amanda Friday. Alva Shun, writer. Read by Chuck Williamson. Shigoch, M.D. Read by Alan Mapstone. Rodrigo Quast, acrobat. Read by Wupa Hippo. Alfred Hugenberg, escaped from a reform school. Read by Charlotte Duckett. Countess Geschwitz. Read by Capricia Page. Bianetta. Read by Sally McConnell. Ludmilla Steinherz. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Magalona. Read by Margaret Espayat. Cadidia, her daughter. Read by Sally McConnell. Count Casti Piani. Read by Algy Pag. Punchu, a banker. Read by Alan Wayman. Halman, a journalist. Read by Lambda. Bob, a groom. Read by Tech Savvy. A detective. Read by Grendel B. Lightyear. Kungu Poti, Imperial Prince of Uahubi. Read by Vupa Hippo. Dr. Hilti, Tutor. Read by Lambda. Jack. Read by Bob Gonzalez. Narration read by Elizabeth Clett. Act I. The Hall of Earth Spirit, Act Four feebly lighted by an oil lamp on the centre table even this is dimmed by a heavy shade lulu's picture is gone from the easel which still stands by the foot of the stairs the fire screen and the chair by the ottoman are gone too down left is a small tea table with a coffee pot and a cup of black coffee on it and an armchair next it in this chair deep in cushions with a plaid shawl over her knees sits Countess Geschwitz in a tight black dress. Rodrigo, clad as a servant, sits on the ottoman. At the rear, Alva Schön is walking up and down before the entrance door. He lets people wait for him as if he were a concert conductor. I beg of you, don't speak. Hold my tongue with a head as full of thoughts as mine is? I absolutely can't believe she's changed so awfully much to her advantage there. She is more glorious to look at than I have ever seen her. God preserve me from founding my life happiness on your taste and judgment. If the sickness has hit her as it has you, I'm smashed and through. You're leaving the contagious ward like an acrobat lady who's had an accident after giving herself up to art. You can scarcely blow your nose any more. First you need a quarter hour to sort your fingers, and then you have to be mighty careful not to break off the tip. What puts us under the ground gives her health and strength again. That's all right and fine enough, but I don't think I'll be travelling off with her this evening. You will let your bride journey all alone after all? In the first place the old fellow's going with her to protect her in case anything serious. My escort could only be suspicious. And secondly... I must wait here till my costumes are ready. I'll get across the frontier soon enough, all right, and I hope in the meantime she'll put on a little embonpoint, too. Then we'll get married, provided I can present her before a respectable public. I love the practical in a woman. What theories they make up for themselves are all the same to me. Aren't they to you, too, doctor? I haven't heard what you are saying. I'd never have got my person mixed up in this plot if she hadn't kept tickling my bare pate before her sentence. If only she doesn't start doing too much as soon as she's out of Germany. I'd like best to take her to London for six months and let her fill up on plum cakes. In London one expands just from the sea air. And then, too, in London one doesn't feel with every swallow of beer as if the hand of fate were at one's throat. I've been asking myself for a week whether a person who'd been sentenced to prison could still be made to go as the chief figure in a modern drama. If the man would only come now. 
I've still got to redeem my properties out of the pawn shop here too. Six hundred kilos of the best iron. The baggage rate on him is always three times as much as my own ticket, so that the whole junket isn't worth a trousers button. When I went into the pawn shop with him, dripping with sweat, they asked me if the things were genuine. I'd have really done better to have had the costumes made abroad. In Paris, for instance, they see at the first glance where one's best points are, and bravely lay them bare. But you can't learn that with bow legs. It's got to be studied on classically shaped people. In this country, they're as scared of naked skin as they are abroad of dynamite bombs. A couple of years ago, I was fined 50 marks at the Alhambra Theatre because people could see I had a few hairs on my chest. Not enough to make a respectable toothbrush. But the fine arts minister opined that the little schoolgirls might lose their joy in knitting stockings because of it. And since then, I have myself shaved once a month. If I didn't need every bit of my creative power now for the world conqueror, I might like to test the problem and see what could be done with it. That's the curse of our young literature. We're so much too literary. We only know such questions and problems as come up among writers and cultured people. We cannot see beyond the limits of our own professional interests. In order to get back on the trail of a great and powerful art, we must move as much as possible among men who've never read a book in their lives, whom the simplest animal instincts direct in all they do. I've tried already, with all my might, to work according to those principles in my earth spirit. The woman who is my model for the chief figure in that breathes today and has for a year behind barred windows. And on that account, for some incomprehensible reason, the play was only brought to performance by the Society for Free Literature. As long as my father was alive, all the stages of Germany stood open to my creations. That has been vastly changed. I've had a pair of tides made of the tenderest blue-green. If they don't make a success abroad, I'll sell mouse traps. The trunks are so delicate, I can't sit on the edge of a table in them. The only thing that will disturb the good impression is my awful bald head, which I owe to my active participation in this great conspiracy. To lie in the hospital in perfect health for three months would make a fat pig of the most run-down old hobo. Since coming out, I fed on nothing but Carlsbad pills. Day and night I have orchestra rehearsals in my intestines. I'll be so washed out before I get across the frontier that I won't be able to lift a bottle cork. How the attendants in the hospital got out of her way yesterday. That was a refreshing sight. The garden was still as the grave. In the loveliest noon sunlight the convalescents didn't venture out of doors. Away back by the contagious ward, she stepped out under the mulberry trees and swayed on her ankles on the gravel. The doorkeeper had recognized me, and a young doctor, who met me in the corridor, shrunk up as though a revolver had shot him. The sisters vanished into the big rooms or stayed stuck against the walls. When I came back there was not a soul to be seen in the garden or at the gate. No better chance could have been found if we had had the cursed passports. And now the fellow says he isn't going with her. I understand the poor hospital brothers. One has a bad foot, and another has a swollen cheek, and there appears in the midst of them the incarnate death insurance agentess. In the Hall of the Knights, as the blessed division was called, from which I organized my spying, when the news got around there that Sister Theophila had departed this life, not one of the fellows could be kept in bed. They scrambled up to the window bars if they had to drag their pains along with them by the hundred weight. I never heard such swearing in my life. Allow me, Fräulein von Geschwitz, to come back to my proposition once more. Though my father was shot in this room, still I can see in the murder 
as in the punishment nothing but a horrible misfortune that has befallen her nor do i think that my father if he had come through alive would have withdrawn his support from her entirely whether your plan for freeing her will succeed still seems to me very doubtful though i wouldn't like to discourage you but i can find no words to express the admiration with which your self-sacrifice your energy your superhuman scorn of death inspires me i don't believe any man ever risks so much for a woman let alone for a friend i am not aware fraulein von geschwitz how rich you are but the expenses for what you have accomplished must have exhausted your fortune may i venture to offer you a loan of twenty thousand marks which i should have no trouble raising for you in cash how we did rejoice when sister theophilia was really dead from that day on we were free from custody we changed our beds as we liked i had done my hair like hers and copied every tone of her voice when the professor came he called her nadigis fraulein and said to me it's better living here than in prison when the sister suddenly was missing we looked at each other in suspense we had both been sick five days now was the deciding moment next morning came the assistant how is sister theophilia dead we communicated behind his back and when he had gone we sank into each other's arms god be thanked god be thanked what pains it cost me to keep my darling from betraying how well she already was you have nine years of prison before you i cried to her early and late now they probably won't let her stay in the contagious ward three days more i lay in the hospital full three months to spy out the ground after toilfully paddling to gather the qualities necessary for such a long stay now i act the valet here with you dr schön so that no strange servants may come into the house where is the bridegroom who has ever done so much for his bride my fortune has also been destroyed when you succeed in developing her into a respectable artiste you will put the world in debt to you with the temperament and beauty that she has to give out of the depths of her nature she can make the most blase public hold its breath and then too she will be protected by acting passion from a second time becoming a criminal in reality i'll soon drive her kiddishness out of her there he comes steps loudon in the gallery then the curtains part at the head of the stairs and shigoch in a long black coat with a white sunshade in his right hand comes down throughout the play his speech is interrupted with frequent yawns confound the darkness how the doors the sun burns your eyes out Geschwitz, wearily unwrapping herself i'm coming her ladyship has seen no daylight for three days we live here like in a snuff-box since nine o'clock this morning i've been round all the old clothes men three brand new trunks stuffed full of old trousers i've expressed to buenos aires via bremerhaven my legs are dangling on me like the tongue of a bell that's the new life it's going to be from now on where are you going to get off tomorrow morning i hope not straight into the ox butter hotel again i can tell you a fine hotel i lived there with a lady lion tamer the people were born in berlin geschwitz upright in the armchair come and help me rodrigo hurries to her and supports her and you'll be safer from the police there than on a high tight rope he means to let you go with her alone this afternoon maybe he's still suffering from his chilblains do you want me to start my new engagement in bathrobe and slippers hmm sister theophilo wouldn't have gone to heaven so promptly either if she hadn't felt so affectionately towards our patient she'll have a different value when one must serve through a honeymoon with her anyway it can't hurt her if she gets a little fresh air beforehand Alva a pocket-book in his hand, 
to Geschwitz, who was leaning on a chair back by the center table. This holds ten thousand marks. Thank you, no. Please take it. Geschwitz, to Shigoch. Come along at last. Patience, Fräulein. It's only a stone's throw across Hospital Street. I'll be here with her in five minutes. You're bringing her here? I'm bringing her here. Or do you fear for your health? You see that I fear nothing? According to the latest wire, the doctor is on his way to Constantinople to have his earth spirit produced before the Sultan by harem ladies and eunuchs. Alva, opening the center door under the gallery. It's shorter for you through here. Axi and Shigoch and Countess Geschwitz. Alva locks the door. You were going to give more money to the crazy skyrocket? What has that to do with you? I get paid like a lamplighter, though I had to demoralize all the sisters in the hospital. Then came the assistants and the doctor's turn, and then— Will you seriously inform me that the medical professors let themselves be influenced by you? With the money those gentlemen cost me, I could become President of the United States. But Fräulein von Geschwitz has reimbursed you for every penny that you spent. So far as I know, you're getting a monthly salary of 500 marks from her besides. It is often pretty hard to believe in your love for the unhappy murderess. When I asked Fräulein von Geschwitz just now to accept my help, it certainly was not to incite your insatiable avarice. The admiration which I have learnt to have for Fräulein von Geschwitz in this affair, I am far from feeling towards you. It is not at all clear to me what claims of any kind you can make upon me. <sighs> that you chance to be present at the murder of my father has not yet created the slightest bond of relationship between you and me. On the contrary, I am firmly convinced that if the heroic undertaking of Countess Geschwitz had not come your way, you would be lying somewhere today without a penny, drunken in the gutter. And do you know what would have become of you if you hadn't sold for two millions the tuppenny paper your father ran? You'd have hitched up with the stringiest sort of belly girl and been today a stable boy in the Humpelmeyer Circus. What work do you do? You've written a drama of horrors in which my bride's calves are the two chief figures and which no high-class theatre will produce. You walk in pyjamas, you fresh rag-bag you. Two years ago I balanced two saddled cavalry horses on this chest. How that'll go now after this, clasping his bald head, is a question sure enough. The foreign girls will get a fine idea of German art when they see the sweat come beading through my tights at every fresh kilo weight. I shall make the whole auditorium stink with my exhalations. You're weak as a dish, clout. Would to God you were right. Or did you perhaps intend to insult me? If so, I'll set the tip of my toe to your jaw so that your tongue will crawl along the carpet over there. Try it! Steps and voices outside. Who is that? You can thank God that I have no public here before me. Who can that be? That is my beloved. It's a full year now since we've seen each other. But how should they be back already? Who can be coming there? I expect no one. Oh, the devil, unlock it. Hide yourself. I'll get behind the portieres. I've stood there once before, a year ago. Disappears right. Alva opens the rear door, whereupon Alfred Hugenberg enters, hat in hand. With whom have I... you... aren't you... Alfred Hugenberg. What can I do for you? I've come from Munsterberg. I ran away this morning. Uh, my eyes are bad. I am forced to keep the blinds closed. I need your help. You will not refuse me. I have a plan ready. Can anyone hear us? What do you mean? What sort of a plan? Are you alone? Yes. What do you want to impart to me? I had two plans I already let drop. 
What I shall tell you now has been worked out to the last possible chance. If I had money, I should not confide it with you. I thought about it a long time before coming. Will you not permit me to set forth and show you my design? Will you kindly tell me just what you are talking about? She cannot possibly be so indifferent to you that I must tell you that. The evidence you gave the coroner helped her more than anything the defending counsel said. I beg to decline the supposition. He would say that. I understand that, of course. But all the same, you were her best witness. You were? You said my father was about to force her to shoot herself. He was, too. But they didn't believe me. I wasn't put on my oath. Where have you come from now? From a reform school. I broke out this morning. And what do you have in view? I am trying to get into the confidence of a turnkey. What do you mean to live on? I'm living with a girl who's had a child by my father. Who is your father? He's a police captain. I know the prison without ever having been inside it. And nobody in it will recognize me as I am now. But I don't count on that at all. I know an iron ladder by which one can get from the first court to the roof and through an opening there into the attic. There's no way up to it from inside, but in all five wings, boards and laughs, and great heaps of shavings are lying under the roofs, and I'll drag them all together in the middle and set fire to them. My pockets are full of matches and all the things used to make fires. But then you'll burn up there. Of course, if I'm not rescued. But to get to the first court, I must have a turnkey in my power, and for that I need money. Not that I mean to bribe him. That wouldn't go. I must lend him money to send his three children to the country, and then, at four o'clock in the morning, when the prisoners of respected families are discharged, I'll slip in the door. He'll lock up behind me and ask me what I'm after, and I'll ask him to let me out again in the evening. And before it gets light, I'm up in the attic. How did you escape from the reform school? I jumped out the window. I need two hundred marks for the rascal to send his family to the country. Rodrigo stepping out of the portieres right will the herr baron have coffee in the music room or on the veranda where does that man come from out of the same door he jumped out of the same door i've taken him into my service he is dependable hugenberg grasping his temples fool thus i am oh fool oh yeah we've seen each other here before cut away now to your vice mamma your kid brother might like to uncle his brothers and sisters. Make your Sir Papa the grandfather of his children. You're the only thing we've missed. If you once get into my sight in the next two weeks, I'll beat your bean up for porridge. Uh, be quiet, you. I'm a fool. What do you want to do with your fire? Don't you know the lady's been dead three weeks? Did they cut off her head? No, she's got that still. She was meshed by the cholera. That is not true. What do you know about it? There, read it, here. Taking out a paper and pointing to the place. The murderess of Dr. Schoen. Gives Hugenberg the paper. He reads. The murderess of Dr. Schoen has in some incomprehensible way fallen ill of cholera in prison. It doesn't say she's dead. Well, what else do you suppose she is? She's been lying in the churchyard three weeks. Back in the left-hand corner behind the rubbish heap, where the little crosses are with no names on them, there she lies under the first one. You'll know the spot because the grass hasn't grown on it. Hang a tin wreath there, and then get back to your nursery school, or I'll denounce you to the police. I know the female that beguiles her leisure hours with you. Hugenberg to Alva. Is it true that she's dead? Thank God, yes. Please do not keep me here any longer. My doctor has forbidden me to receive visitors. My future is worth so little now. I would gladly have given the last scrap of what life is worth for me for her happiness. Hey ho! One way or another, I'll sure go to the devil now. If you dare in any way to approach me or the doctor here, or my honourable friend Shigolch too near, 
I'll inform on you for intended arson. You need three good years to learn when not to stick your fingers in. Now get out. Fool! Get out! Throws him out the door, coming down. I wonder you didn't put your purse at that rogue's disposal, too. I won't stand your damn jabbering. The boy's little finger is worth more than all you. I've had enough of this Geschwitz's company. If my bride is to become a corporation with limited liability, somebody else can go in ahead of me. I propose to make a magnificent trapeze artist out of her and willingly risk my life to do it. But then I'll be master of the house and will myself indicate what cavaliers she is to receive. The boy has what our age lacks, a hero nature. Therefore, of course, he is going to ruin. Do you remember how before sentence was passed, he jumped out of the witness box and yelled at the justice, How do you know what would have become of you if you'd had to run around the cafes barefoot every night when you were ten years old? If I could only have given him one in the jaw for that right away. Thank God there are jails where scum like that get some respect for the law pounded into them. One like him might have been my model for my world conqueror. For twenty years literature has presented nothing but demi-men. Men who can beget no children and women who can bear none. That's called the modern problem. I've ordered a hippopotamus whip two inches thick. If that has no success with her, you can fill my cranium with potato soup. Be it love or be it whipping, female flesh never inquires. Only give it some amusement and it stays firm and fresh. She is now in her twentieth year, has been married three times and has satisfied a gigantic horde of lovers, and her heart's desires are at last pretty plain. But the man's got to have the seven deadly sins on his forehead, or she honors him not. If he looks as if a dog-catcher had spat him out on the street, then with such women folks. He needn't be afraid of a prince. I'll rent a garage fifty feet high and break her in there. And when she's learned the first diving leap without breaking her neck, I'll pull on a black coat and not stir a finger the rest of my life. When she's educated practically, it doesn't cost a woman half as much trouble to support her husband as the other way around, if only the man takes care of the mental labor for her and doesn't let the sense of the family go to wreck. I have learnt to rule humanity and drive it in harness before me like a well-broken foreign hand. But that boy sticks in my head. Really, I can still take private lessons in the scorn of the world from that schoolboy. She'll just comfortably let her height be papered with thousand mark bills. I'll extract salaries out of the directors with a centrifugal pump. I know their kind. When they don't need a man, let him shine their shoes for them. But when they must have an artist, they cut her down from the very gallows with their own hands and with the most entangling compliments. In my situation, there's nothing more in the world to fear but death. In the realm of sensation... I am the poorest beggar, but I can no longer scrape up the moral courage to exchange my established position for the excitements of the wild, adventurous life. She had sent Papa Shigolj and me together in chase of some strong antidote for sleeplessness. We each got a twenty-mark piece for expenses. There we see the youngsters sitting in the nightlight café. He was sitting like a criminal on the prisoner's bench. She gold sniffed at him from all sides and remarked, He is still virgin. Up in the gallery, dragging steps are heard. There she is, the future magnificent trapeze artist of the present age. The curtains part at the stairhead, 
and Lulu, supported by Shigoch and in a black dress, slowly and wearily descends. Phew, old mould. We've still got to get over the frontier today. Rodrigo, glaring stupidly at Lulu. Thunder of heaven! Death! Slowly! You're pinching my arm! How did you ever get the shamelessness to break out of prison with such a wolf's face? Stop your snout! I'll run for the police. I'll give information. This scarecrow let herself be seen in tights? The padding alone would cost two months' salary. You're the most perfidious swindler that ever had lodging in Oxbutter Hotel. Kindly refrain from insulting the lady. Insulting, you call that? For this naught bone's sake, I've worn myself away. I can earn my own living. I'll be a clown if I can still stand firm under a broomstick. But let the lightning strike me on the spot if I don't warm ten thousand marks a year for life out of your tricks and frauds. I can tell you that. A pleasant trip. I'm going for the police. Exit. Run, run. He'll take good care of himself. We're rid of him. Now, some black coffee for the lady. Alva at the table left. Here is the coffee, ready to pour. I must look after the sleeping car tickets. Oh, freedom. Thank God for freedom. I'll be back for you in half an hour. We'll celebrate our departure in the station restaurant. I'll order a supper that'll keep us going till tomorrow. Good morning, doctor. Good evening. Pleasant rest. Thanks, I know every door handle here. So long. Have a good time. Exit. I haven't seen a room for a year and a half. Curtains, chairs, pictures. Won't you drink it? I've swallowed enough black coffee these five days. Have you any brandy? I've got some elixir de spa. That reminds one of old times. Looks round the hall while Alva fills two glasses. Where's my picture gone? I've got it in my room, so no one shall see it here. Bring it down here now. Didn't you even lose your vanity in prison? How anxious at heart one gets when one hasn't seen herself for months. One day I got a brand new dustpan. When I swept up at seven in the morning, I held the back of it up before my face. Tin doesn't flatter, but I took pleasure in it all the same. Bring the picture down from your room. Shall I come too? No, heaven's sake. You must spare yourself. I've been sparing myself long enough now. Alva goes out right to get the picture. He has heart trouble, but to have to plague oneself with imagination fourteen months. He kisses with the fear of death on him, and his two knees shake like a frozen vagabond's. In God's name, in this room, if only I had not shot his father in the back. Alva returns with the picture of Lulu in the Piero dress. It's covered with dust. I had leaned it against the fireplace, face to the wall. You didn't look at it all the time I was away? I had so much business to attend to, with the sale of your paper and everything. Countess Geschwitz would have liked to have hung it up in her house. But she had to be prepared for search warrants. He puts the picture on the easel. Now the poor monster is learning the joys of life in Hotel Oxbutter by her own experience. Even now, I don't understand how events hang together. Oh, Gushwitz arranged it all very cleverly. I must admire her inventiveness. But the cholera must have raged fearfully in Hamburg this summer, and on that she founded her plan for freeing me. She took a course in hospital nursing here, and when she had the necessary documents, she journeyed to Hamburg with them, and nursed the cholera patients. At the first opportunity that offered, she put on the underclothes in which a sick woman had just died, and which really ought to have been burnt. The same morning she travelled back here, and came to see me in prison. In my cell, while the wardress was outside, we, as quick as we could, exchanged underclothes. So that was the reason why the Countess and you fell sick of the cholera the same day. Exactly. That was it. 
Geshvitz, of course, was instantly brought from her house to the contagious ward in the hospital. But with me, too, they couldn't think of any other place to take me. So there we lay in one room in the contagious ward behind the hospital. And from the first day, Geshvitz put forth all her art to make our two faces as like each other as possible. Day before yesterday, she was let out as cured. Just now she came back and said she'd forgotten her watch. I put on her clothes, she slipped into my prison frock, and then I came away. Now she's lying over there as the murderess of Dr. Shun. So far as outward appearance goes, you can still agree with the picture as much as ever. I'm a little peaked in the face, but otherwise I've lost nothing. Only one gets incredibly nervous in prison. You looked horribly sick when you came in. I had to, to get our necks out of the noose. And you, what have you done in this year and a half? I've had a success d'esteem in literary circles, with a play I wrote about you. Who's your sweetheart now? An actress I've rented a house for in Carl Street. Does she love you? How should I know that? I haven't seen the woman for six weeks. Can you stand that? Oh, you will never understand that. With me, there's the closest alternation between my sensuality and mental creativeness. So towards you, for example, I have only the choice of regarding you artistically or of loving you. I used to dream every other night that I'd fallen into the hands of a sadic. Come, give me a kiss. It's shining in your eyes, like the water in a deep well one has just thrown a stone into. Come. Alva kisses her. Your lips have got pretty thin anyway. Come. Pushes him into a chair and seats herself on his knee. Do you shudder at me? In Hotel Oxbutter we all got a lukewarm bath every four weeks. The wardresses took that opportunity to search our pockets as soon as we were in the water. She kisses him passionately. <sighs> You're afraid that when I'm away you couldn't write any more poems about me? On the contrary. I shall write a dithyram upon thy glory. I'm only sore about the hideous shoes I'm wearing. They do not encroach upon your charms. Let us be thankful for the favor of this moment. I don't feel at all like that today. Do you remember the costume ball, where I was dressed like a knight squire? How those wineful women ran after me that time? Geshvitz crawled round, round my feet, and begged me to step on her face with my cloth shoes. Oh, come, dear heart! Lulu, in the tone with which one quiets a restless child. Quietly! I shot your father. I do not love thee less for that. One kiss. Bend your head back. She kisses him with deliberation. You hold back the fire of my soul with the most dexterous art. And your breast breathes so virginly, too. Yet if it weren't for your two great dark childish eyes, I must needs have thought you the cunningest whore that ever hurled a man to destruction. Lulu, in high spirits. Would God I were. Come over the border with us today. Then we can see each other as often as we will, and we'll get more pleasure from each other than now. Through this dress, I feel your body like a symphony. These slender ankles, this cantable, this rapturous crescendo, and these knees, this capriccio, and this powerful andante of lust. How peacefully these two slim rivals press against each other in the consciousness that neither equals the other in beauty, till their capricious mistress wakes up and the rival lovers separate like the two hostile poles. I shall sing your praises so that your senses shall whirl. 
Meanwhile, I'll bury my hands in your hair. She does so. But here we'll be disturbed. You have robbed me of my reason. Aren't you coming with me today? Uh, but the old fellow's going with you. He won't turn up again. Is not that the divan on which your father bled to death? Be still. Be still. Curtain. End of Act One. Act Two of Lulu Two, Pandora's Box by Frank Vedekind, translated by Samuel Atkins Elliot Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. A spacious salon in white stucco. In the rear wall, between two high mirrors, a wide folding doorway showing in the rear room a big card-table surrounded by Turkish upholstered chairs. In the left wall two doors, the upper one to the entrance hall, the lower to the dining-room. Between them a rococo console with a white marble top, and above it Lulu's Piero picture in a narrow gold frame let into the wall. Two other doors right, near the lower one a small table. Wide and brightly covered chairs stand about, with thin legs and fragile arms, and in the middle is a sofa of the same style, Louis the Fifteenth. A large company is moving about the salon in lively conversation. The men, Alva, Rodrigo, Marquis Castipiani, banker Punchu, and journalist Halmon, are in evening dress. Lulu wears a white directoire dress with huge sleeves and white lace falling freely from belt to feet. Her arms are in white kid gloves, her hair done high with a little tuft of white feathers. Geschwitz is in a bright blue hussar waist, trimmed with white fur and laced with silver braid, a tall tight collar with a white bow, and stiff cuffs with huge ivory links. Magalona is in bright rainbow-coloured shot silk with very wide sleeves, long narrow waist, and three ruffles of spiral rose-coloured ribbons and violet bouquets. Her hair is parted in the middle and drawn low over her temples. On her forehead is a mother-of-pearl ornament, held by a fine chain under her hair. Kadidia, her daughter, twelve years old, has a bright green satin gaiters, which yet leave visible the tops of her white silk socks, and a white lace-covered dress with bright green narrow sleeves, pearl-gray gloves, and free black hair under a big bright green hat with white feathers. Bianetta is in dark green velvet the collar sewn with pearls, and a full skirt, its hem embroidered with great false topazes set in silver. Ludmilla Steinherz is in a glaring summer frock, striped red and blue. Rodrigo stands centre, a full glass in his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg your pardon. Please be quiet. I drink, permit me to drink, for this is the birthday party of our amiable hostess, taking Lulu's arm, of Countess Adelaide Dubra, damned and done for. I drink, therefore, and so forth. Go to it, ladies. All surround Lulu and clink with her. Alva presses Rodrigo's hand. I congratulate you. I am sweating like a roast pig. Alva to Lulu. Let's see if everything's in order in the card-room. Alva and Lulu exeunt rear. Bianetta speaks to Rodrigo. They were telling me just now you were the strongest man in the world. That I am. May I put my strength at your disposal? I love sharpshooters better. Three months ago a sharpshooter stepped into the casino, and every time he went bang, I felt like this. She wriggles her hips. Casti Piani, who speaks throughout the act in a bored and weary tone, to Magalona. Say, dearie, how does it happen we see your nice little princess here for the first time to-night? Meaning Cadidia. Do you really find her so delightful? She's still in the convent. She must be back in school again on Monday. What did you say, Mamma? I was just telling the gentleman that you got the highest mark in geometry last week. 
some pretty hair she has got just look at her feet the way she walks by god she's got breeding magalona smiling but my dear sirs take pity on her she's nothing but a child still better trouble me damned little to heilmann heilmann i'd give ten years of my life if i could initiate the young lady into the ceremonies of our secret society but you won't get me to consent to that for a million i won't have the child's youth ruined the way mine was <laughs> confessions of a lovely soul to magalona would you not agree either for a set of real diamonds don't brag you'll give as few real diamonds to me as to my child you know that quite the best yourself kadidia goes into the rear room but is nobody at all going to play this evening why of course comtesse i'm counting on it very much for one then let's take our places right away the gentlemen will soon come then may i ask you to excuse me just a second i must say a word to my friend casti piani offering his arm to bianetta may i have the honour to be your partner you always hold such a lucky hand now just give me your other arm and then lead us into the gambling hell the three go off so rear say mr punchu have you still got a few jungfrau shares for me maybe jungfrau shares to Hallmann. the lady means the stock of the funicular railway on the jungfrau the jungfrau you know the virgin is a mountain up which they want to build a wire railway to Margalona. You know, young lady, just so there may be no confusion, and how easy that would be in this select circle. Yes, I still have some four thousand Jungfrau shares, but I should like to keep those for myself. Uh, there won't be such another chance soon of making a little fortune out of hand. I have only one loan share of this Jungfrau stock so far. I should like to have more too i'll try mr heilman to look after some for you but i'll tell you beforehand you'll have to pay drug store prices for them my fortune teller advised me to look about me in time all my savings are in jungfrau shares now if it doesn't turn out well mr punchu i'll scratch your eyes out i am perfectly sure of my affairs my dearie alva who has come back from the card-room to magalona i can guarantee your fears are absolutely unfounded i paid very dear for my young frau stock and haven't regretted it for a minute they're going up steadily from day to day oh, there never was such a thing before all the better if you're right taking punchu's arm come my friend let's try our luck now at baccarat all go out rear except geschwitz and rodrigo who scribbles something on a piece of paper and folds it up then notices Geschwitz. Mm, Madame Countess. Geschwitz starts and shrinks. Do I look as dangerous as that? To himself. I must make a bon mot. Aloud. May I perhaps make so bold? You can go to the devil. Costi Piani, as he leads Lulu in. Permit me a word or two. Lulu, not noticing Rodrigo, who presses his note into her hand. Oh, as many as you like. Rodrigo bows and goes out, rear. Costi Piani to Geschwitz. Leave us alone. Lulu to Costi Piani. Have I hurt you again in any way? Costi Piani, since Geschwitz does not stir. Are you deaf? <sighs> Geschwitz, sighing deeply, goes out, rear. Just say straight out how much you want. With money you can no longer serve me. What makes you think that we have no more money? You handed out the last bit of it to me yesterday. If you're sure of that, then I suppose it's so. You're down on the bare ground, you and your writer. Then why all the words? If you want to have me for yourself, you need not first threaten me with execution. I know that. But I've told you more than once that you won't be my downfall. 
I haven't sucked you dry because you loved me, but loved you in order to suck you. Bionetta is more to my taste from top to bottom than you. You've set out the choicest sweetmeats, and after one has frittered his time away at them, he finds he's hungrier than before. You've loved too long, even for our present relations. With a healthy young man, you only ruin his nervous system. But you'll fit all the more perfectly in the position I have sought out for you. You're crazy! Have I commissioned you to find a position for me? I told you, though, that I was an appointments agent. You told me you were a police spy. <laughs> One can't live on that alone. I was an appointments agent, originally. Till I blundered over a minister's daughter I'd got a position for in Valparaiso. The little darling in her childhood's dreams imagined the life even more intoxicating than it was, and complained of it to Mamma. On that they nubbed me, but by reliable demeanour I soon enough won the confidence of the criminal police and they sent me here on a hundred and fifty marks a month, because they were triply our contingent here on account of these everlasting bomb explosions. But who can get along on a hundred and fifty marks a month? My colleagues get women to support them, but, of course, I found it more convenient to take up my former calling again, and of the numberless adventuresses of the best families of the entire world, whom chance brings together here, I have already forwarded many a young creature, hungry for life, to the place of her natural vocation. I wouldn't do in that business. Your views on that question make no difference whatever to me. The Department of Justice will pay anyone who delivers the murderess of Dr. Shern into the hands of the police a thousand marks. I only need to whistle for the constable who's standing down at the corner to have earned a thousand marks. Against that, the house of Oikonomopolis in Cairo bids sixty pounds for you, twelve hundred marks, two hundred more than the Attorney General. And besides, I am still so far a friend of mankind that I prefer to help my loves to happiness, not plunge them into misfortune. The life in such a house can never make a woman of my stamp happy. When I was fifteen, that might have happened to me. I was desperate then, thought I should never be happy. I bought a revolver, and ran one night barefoot through the deep snow, over the bridge to the park to shoot myself there. But then, by good luck, I lay three months in the hospital without setting eyes on a man and in that time my eyes opened, and I got to know myself. Night after night in my dreams I saw the man for whom I was created, and who was created for me. And then, when I was let out on the men again, I was no longer a silly goose. Since then I can see on a man, in a pitch-dark night, and a hundred feet away, whether we're suited to each other. And if I sin against that insight, I feel the next day dirtied, body and soul, and need weeks to get over the loathing I have for myself. And now you imagine I'll give myself to every and any Tom and Harry. Toms and Harrys don't patronize Oikonomopolis of Cairo. His custom consists of Scottish lords, Russian dignitaries, Indian governors, and our jolly Rhineland captains of industry. I must only guarantee that you speak French. With your gift for languages, you'll quickly learn as much English, besides, as you'll need to get on with. And you'll reside in a royally furnished apartment, with an outlook on the minarets of El Adza Mosque, and walk around all day on Persian carpets as thick as your fist, and dress every evening in a fabulous Paris gown, and drink as much champagne as your customers can pay for. And, finally, you'll even remain, up to a certain point, your own mistress. If the man doesn't please you, you needn't bring him any reciprocal feelings. Just let him give in his card, and then— Shrugs and snaps his fingers. 
If the ladies didn't get used to that, the whole business would be simply impossible, because every one after the first four weeks would go headlong to the devil. I do believe that since yesterday you've got a screw loose somewhere. Am I to understand that the Egyptian will pay fifteen hundred francs for a person whom he's never seen? I took the liberty of sending him your pictures. Those pictures that I gave you, you've sent to him? You see, he can value them better than I. The picture in which you stand before the mirror as Eve, he'll probably hang up at the house door after you've got there. And then there's one more thing for you to notice, with Oikonomopolis of Cairo. You'll be safer from your bloodhounds than if you crept into a Canadian wilderness. It isn't so easy to transport an Egyptian courtesan to a German prison. First, on account of the mere expense, and second, from fear of coming too close to eternal justice. What's your eternal justice to do with me? You can see as plain as your five fingers I shan't let myself be locked up in any such amusement place. Then do you want me to whistle for the policeman? Why don't you simply ask me for twelve hundred marks if you want the money? I want for no money, and I also don't ask for it, because you're dead broke. We still have thirty thousand marks. In Jungfrau stock. I never have anything to do with stock. The Attorney-General pays in the national currency, and Oikonomopolis pays in English gold. You can be on board early to-morrow. The passage doesn't last much more than five days. In two weeks at most, you're in safety. Here you are nearer to prison than anywhere. It's a wonder which I, as one of the secret police, cannot understand that you two have been able to live for a full year unmolested. But just as I came on the track of your antecedents, so any day, with your mighty consumption of men, one of my colleagues may make the happy discovery. Then I may just wipe my mouth, and you will spend in prison the most enjoyable years of your life. If you will kindly decide quickly, the train goes at twelve-thirty. If you haven't struck a bargain before eleven, I whistle up the policeman. If we have, I pack you, just as you stand, into a carriage, drive you to the station, and to-morrow escort you on board ship. But is it possible you can be serious in all this? Don't you understand that I can act now only for your bodily rescue? I'll go with you to America or to China, but I can't let myself be sold of my own accord. That is worse than prison. Casti Piani, drawing a letter from his pocket. Just read this effusion. I'll read it to you. Here's the postmark, Cairo, so you won't believe I work with forged documents. The girl is a Berliner, was married two years, and to a man whom you would have envied her, a former comrade of mine. He travels now for the Hamburg Colonial Company. Then perhaps he visits his wife occasionally. That is not incredible. But hear this impulsive expression of her feelings. My white slave traffic seems to me absolutely no more honourable than the very best judge would tax it with being. But a cry of joy like this lets me feel a certain moral satisfaction for a moment. I am proud to earn my money by scattering happiness with full hands. Reads. Dear Mr. Meyer, uh, that's my name as a white slave trader, when you go to Berlin, please go right away to the conservatory on the Potsdamer Strasse and ask for Gusti von Rosenkorn. The most beautiful woman that I've ever seen in nature. Delightful hands and feet, a naturally small waist, straight back, full body, big eyes, and short nose, just the sort you like best. I have written to her already. She has no prospects with her singing. Her mother hasn't a penny. 
Sorry, she's already twenty-two, but she's pining for love. Can't marry, because absolutely without means. I've spoken with Madame. They'd like to take another German, if she's well educated and musical. Italians and Frenchwomen can't compete with us, cause of too little culture. If you should see Fritz, Fritz is the husband, he's getting a divorce, of course. Tell him it was all a bore. He didn't know any better, nor did I either. Now come the exact details. I cannot sell the only thing that ever was my own. Let me read some more. This very evening I'll hand over to you our entire wealth. Believe me, for God's sake, I've got your last red cent. If we haven't left this house before eleven, you and your lot will be transported tomorrow in a police car to Germany. You can't give me up. Do you think that will be the worst thing I can have done in my life? I must, in case we go tonight, have just a brief word with Bionetta. He goes into the card room, leaving the door open behind him. Lulu stares before her, mechanically crumpling up the note that Rodrigo stuck into her hand, which she has held in her fingers throughout the dialogue. Alva, behind the card table, gets up, a bill in his hand, and comes into the salon. Alva to Lulu. Brilliantly! It's going brilliantly! Geschwitz is wagering her last shirt. Punchu has promised me ten more Jungfrau shares. Steinhertz is making her little gains and profits. <laughs> Exit lower right. I, in a bordel. She reads the paper she holds and laughs madly. Alva coming back with a cash box in his hand. Aren't you going to play too? Oh, yes, surely. Why not? Uh, by the way, it's in the Berliner Tageblatt today that Alfred Hugenberg has hurled himself over the stairs in prison. Is he too in prison? Only in a sort of house of detention. Exit rear. Lulu is about to follow, but Countess Geschwitz meets her in the doorway. You are going because I come? No, God knows. But when you come, then I go. You have defrauded me of all the good things of this world that I still possessed. You might at the very least preserve the outward forms of politeness in your intercourse with me. I am as polite to you as to any other woman. I only beg you to be equally so to me. Have you forgotten the passionate endearments by which, while we lay together in the hospital, you seduced me into letting myself be locked into prison for you? Well, why else did you bring me down with the cholera beforehand? I swore very different things to myself, even while it was going on, from what I had to promise you. I am shaken with horror at the thought that that should ever become reality. Then you cheated me consciously, deliberately. What have you been cheated of, then? Your physical advantages have found so enthusiastic an admirer here that I ask myself if I won't have to give piano lessons once more to keep alive. No seventeen-year-old child could make a man madder with love than you, a pervert, are making him, poor fellow, by your shrewishness. Of whom are you speaking? I don't understand a word. I'm speaking of your acrobat, of Rodrigo Quest. He's an athlete. He balances two saddled cavalry horses on his chest. Can a woman desire anything more glorious? He told me just now that he'd jump into the water tonight if you did not take pity on him. I do not envy you this cleverness, with which you torture the helpless victims sacrificed to you by their inscrutable destiny. My own plight has not yet wrung from me the pity that I feel for you. I feel free as a god when I think to what creatures you are enslaved. Who do you mean? Costipiani, upon whose forehead the most degenerate baseness is written in letters of fire. Be silent. I'll kick you if you speak ill of him. He loves me with an uprightness against which your most venturous self-sacrifices are poor as beggary. He gives me such proofs of self-denial as reveal you for the first time in all your loathsomeness. You didn't get finished in your mother's womb, neither as woman nor as man. You have no human nature like the rest of us. The stuff didn't go far enough for a man, 
and for a woman you got too much brain into your skull that's the reason you're crazy turn to miss bionetta she can be had for everything for pay press a gold piece into her hand and she'll belong to you all the company save cadidia throng in out of the card-room for the lord's sake what has happened nothing whatever we're thirsty that's all everybody has won we can't believe it it seems i have won a whole fortune don't boast of it my child that isn't lucky but the bank has won too how is that possible it is colossal where all this money comes from let us not ask enough that we need not spare the champagne i can pay for a supper in a respectable restaurant afterwards anyway <laughs> to the buffet ladies to the buffet all exeunt lower left rodrigo holding lulu back a moment my heart have you read my billet doux threaten me with discovery as much as you like i have no more twenty thousands to dispose of don't lie to me you punk you've still got forty thousand in jungfrau stock your so-called spouse has just been bragging of it himself then turn to him with your blackmailing it's all one to me what he does with his money thank you with that blockhead i need twice twenty-four hours to make him grasp what i was talking about and then come his explanations that make one deathly sick and meanwhile my bride writes me it's all up and i can just hang a hurdy-gurdy over my shoulder have you got engaged here then maybe i ought to have asked your permission first what were my thanks here that i freed you from prison at the cost of my health you abandoned me i might have had to be a baggage man if this girl hadn't taken me up at my very first entrance right away they threw a velvet-covered armchair at my head this country is too decadent to value genuine shows of strength any more if i'd been a boxing kangaroo they'd have interviewed me and put my picture in all the papers thank heaven i'd already made the acquaintance of my celestine she's got the savings of twenty years deposited with the government and she loves me just for myself she doesn't aim only at vulgar things like you she's had three children by an american bishop all of the greatest promise day after tomorrow we'll get married by the registrar you have my blessing your blessing can be stolen from me i've told my bride i had twenty thousand in stock at the bank and after that he boasts the person loves him for himself she honors in me the man of mind not the man of might as you and all the others have done that's over now first they tore the clothes from one's body and then they waltzed around with a chambermaid i'll be a skeleton before i let myself in again for such diversions then why the devil do you pursue the unfortunate geschwitz with your attentions because the creature is of noble blood i am a man of the world and i can do distinguished conversation better than any of you but now with a gesture my talk is hanging out of my mouth will you get me the money before tomorrow evening or won't you i have no money i'll have hand droppings in my head before i let myself be put off with that he'll give you his last cent if you'll only do your damned duty once you lured the poor lad here and now he can see where to scare up a suitable engagement for his accomplishments what has it to do with you if he wastes his money with women or at cards do you absolutely want then to throw the last penny that his father earned by his paper into the jaws of this rapacious pack you'll make four people happy if you'll not take things too exactly and sacrifice yourself for a beneficent purpose has it got to be only castipiani forever shall i ask him perhaps to light you down the stairs as you wish countess if i don't get the twenty thousand marks by tomorrow evening i make a statement to the police and your court has an end auf wiedersehen helmon enters breathless upper right you're looking for miss magalona she's not here no i'm looking for something else 
Rodrigo taking him to the entry door, opposite him. Second door on the left. Lulu, to Rodrigo. Did you learn that from your bride? Halman, bumping into Punchu in the doorway. Excuse me, my angel. Ah, it's you. Miss Magalone is waiting for you in the lift. You go up with her, please. I'll be right back. He hurries out left. Lulu goes out at lower left. Rodrigo follows her. Sammy eats that. If I don't cut off your ears, you'll cut em off me. If I can't hire out my Jehoshaphat, I've just got to help myself with my brains. Oh, won't they get wrinkled, my brains? Won't they get indisposed? Won't they need to bathe in eau de cologne? Bob, a groom in a red jacket, tight leather breeches, and twinkling riding boots, fifteen years old, brings in a telegram. Mr. Punchu, the banker. Punchu breaks open the telegram and murmurs. Young Frau Funicula stock fallen to. Ay, ay, so goes the world. To Bob. Wait, young man, here you are. Gives him a tip. Tell me, what's your name? Well, it's really Freddy, but they call me Bob, because that's the fashion now. How old are you? Fifteen. Kadidia enters hesitatingly from lower left. I beg your pardon. Can you tell me if Mamma is here? No, my dear. Aside. Devil, she's got breeding. I'm hunting all over for her. I can't find her anywhere. Your mamma will turn up again, as true as my name's Punchu. Looking at Bob. And that pair of breeches on him. Oh, God of justice, it gets uncanny. He goes out, upper right. Haven't you seen my mamma, perhaps? No, but you only need to come with me. Where is she, then? She's gone up in the lift. Come along. No, no, I can't go up with you. We can hide up there, in the corridor. No, no, I can't come, or I'll be scolded. Magalona, terribly excited, rushes in upper left and possesses herself of Kadidia. Ha! There you are at last, you common creature. Oh, Mama! Mama, I was hunting for you. Hunting for me? Did I tell you to hunt for me? What have you had to do with this fellow? Halman, Alva, Ludmilla, Punchu, Geschwitz, and Lulu enter, lower left. Bob has withdrawn. Now, don't bawl before all the people on me. Look out, I tell you. Lulu, as they all surround Kadidia. But you're crying, sweetheart. Why are you crying? My God, she's really been crying. Who's done anything to hurt you, little goddess? Ludmilla kneels before her and folds her in her arms. "'Tell me, cherub, what bad thing has happened? Do you want a cookie? Do you want some chocolate?' "'It's just nerves. The child's getting them much too soon. It would be the best thing if no one paid any attention to her.' Well, "'That sounds like you. You're a pretty mother. The courts will yet take the child away from you and appoint me a guardian.' Isn't that so, my little goddess? Stroking Kadidia's cheeks. I should be glad if we started the baccarat again at last. All go into the card room. Lulu is held back at the door by Bob. Lulu, when Bob has whispered to her. Certainly. Let him come in. Bob opens the door and lets Shigoch enter in evening dress, his patent leather shoes much worn, and keeping on his shabby opera hat. She goch with a look at Bob. Where'd you get him from? The circus. How much does he get? Ask him if it interests you. To Bob. Shut the doors. Bob goes out lower left, shutting the door behind him. She goch sitting down. The truth is, I'm in need of money. I've hired a flat for my mistress. Have you taken another mistress here, too? She's from Frankfurt. In her youth she was mistress to the King of Naples. She tells me every day she was once very bewitching. Lulu outwardly with complete composure. Does she need the money very badly? She wants to fit up her own apartment. Such sums are of no account to you. 
Lulu is suddenly overcome with a fit of weeping. Lulu, flinging herself at Shigoch. Oh, God, omnipotent! Shigoch, patting her. Well, what is it now? It's too horrible! Shigoch draws her onto his knee and holds her in his arms like a little child. Hmm, you're trying to do too much, child. You must go to bed now and then, with a story. Cry, that's right, cry it out. It used to shake you just so fifteen years ago. Nobody has screamed since then the way you could scream. You didn't wear any white tufts on your head then, nor any transparent stockings on your legs. You had neither shoes nor stockings then. Take me home with you. Take me home with you tonight. Please. We'll find carriages enough downstairs. I'll take you with me. I'll take you with me. What is it? It's going round my neck. I'm to be shown up. By who? Who's showing you up? The acrobat. Shigoch with the utmost composure. I'll look after him. Look after him. Please look after him. Then do with me what you will. If he comes to me, he's done for. My window is over the water. But... Shaking his head. He won't come. He won't come. What number do you live at? 376. The last house before the Hippodrome. I'll send him there. He'll come with the crazy person that creeps about my feet. He'll come this very evening. Go home and let them find it comfortable. Just let them come. Tomorrow, bring the gold rings he wears in his ears. Has he got rings in his ears? You can take them out before you let him down. He doesn't notice anything when he's drunk. And then, child, what then? Then I'll give you the money for your mistress. I call that pretty stingy. And whatever else you want. What I have. It's pretty near ten years since we knew each other. Is that all? But you've got a mistress. My frankfurter is no longer of today. But then swear. Haven't I always kept my word to you? Swear that you'll look after him. I'll look after him. Swear it to me. Swear it to me. Shigoch puts his hand on her ankle. By everything that's holy. Tonight, if he comes... By everything that's holy. How cool that is. How hot this is. Drive straight home. They'll come in half an hour. Take a carriage. I'm going... Quick, please. All powerful. Why do you stare at me so again already? Nothing. Well, is your tongue frozen on you? My garter's broken. What if it is? Is that all? What does that auger? What does it? I'll fasten it for you if you'll keep still. That auger's misfortune. Ugh, not for you, child. Cheer up. I'll look after him. Exit. Lulu puts her left foot on a footstool, fastens her garter, and goes out into the card-room. Then Rodrigo is cuffed in from the dining-room lower left by Costi Piani. You can treat me decently anyway. Whatever would induce me to do that? I will know what you said to her here a little while ago. Then you can be very fond of me. Will you bandy words with me, dog? You demanded that she go up in the lift with you. That's a shameless, perfidious lie. She told me so herself. You threatened to denounce her if she didn't go with you. Shall I shoot you on the spot? The shameless hussy! As if anything like that could occur to me! Even if I should want to have her, God knows I don't first need to threaten her with prison. Thank you. That's all I needed to know. Exit, upper left. Such a hound! A fellow I could throw up onto the roof so he'd stick like a Limburger cheese. Come back here, so I can wind your guts round your neck. That would be even better. Lulu enters lower left. Where were you? I've been hunting for you like a pin. I've shown him what it means to start anything with me. Whom? You're Castipiani. 
What made you tell him, you slut, that I wanted to seduce you? Did you not ask me to give myself to my deceased husband's son for twenty thousand in young Frau shares? Because it's your duty to take pity on the poor young fellow. You shut away his father before his nose in the very best years of life. But your Castipiani will think it over before he comes into my side again. I gave him one in the basket that made the tribes fly to heaven like Roman candles. If you've got no better substitute for me, then I'm sorry ever to have had your favor. Lady Geschwitz is in the fearfulest case. She twists herself up and fits. She's at the point of jumping into the water if you let her wait any longer. What's the beast waiting for? For you, to take her with you. Then give her my regards, and she can jump into the water. She'll lend me twenty thousand marks to save me from destruction, if you will preserve her from it herself. If you'll take her off tonight, I'll deposit twenty thousand marks tomorrow, in your name, at any bank you say. And if I don't take her off with me? Denounce me. Elva and I are dead broke. Devil and damnation! You make four people happy if you don't take things too exactly, and sacrifice yourself for a beneficent purpose. That won't go. I know that beforehand. I've tried that out enough now. Who counts on an honorable soul like that in a beggar bones? What the person had for me was her being an aristocrat. My behavior was as gentlemanlike and more as you could find among German circus people. If I'd only just pinched her in the calves once. She is still a virgin. If there's a God in heaven, you'll get paid for your jokes some day. I prophesy that. Geschwitz waits. What shall I tell her? My very best wishes, and I am perverse. I will deliver that. Wait a sec. Is it certain sure I get twenty thousand marks from her? Ask herself. Then tell her I'm ready. I await her in the dining room. I must just first look after a barrel of caviar. Exit left. Lulu opens the rear door and calls in a clear voice, Martha. Countess Geschwitz enters, closing the door behind her. Dear heart, you can save me from death tonight. How? By going to a certain house with the acrobat. For what, dear? He says you must belong to him this very night, or he'll denounce me tomorrow. You know I can't belong to any man. My fate has not permitted that. If you don't please him, that's his own fix. Why has he fallen in love with you? But he'll be as brutal as a hangman. He'll revenge himself for this disappointment and beat my head in. I've been through that already. Can you not possibly spare me this hardest test? What will you gain by his denouncing me? I have still enough of my fortune to take us to America together in the steerage. There you'd be safe from all your pursuers. I want to stay here. I can never be happy in any other city. You must tell him that you can't live without him. Then he'll feel flattered and be gentle as a lamb. You must pay the coachman, too. Give him this paper with the address on it. 376 is a six-class hotel where they're expecting you with him this evening. Geschwitz, shuddering. Oh, how can such a monstrosity save your life? I don't understand that. You have conjured up to torture me the most terrible fate that can fall upon outlawed me. Perhaps the encounter will cure you. Oh, Lulu, if an eternal retribution does exist, I hope I may not have to answer then for you. I cannot make myself believe that no god watches over us. Yet you are probably right that there is nothing there. For how can an insignificant worm like me have provoked his wrath so as to experience only horror, there where all living creatures swoon for bliss. You needn't complain. When you are happy, you are a hundred thousand times happier than one of us ordinary mortals ever is. I know that, too. I envy no one. But I am still waiting. You have deceived me so often already. I am yours, my darling, if you quiet Mr. Acrobat till tomorrow. He only wants his vanity placated. You must beseech him to take pity on you. And tomorrow? I await you, my heart. I shall not open my eyes till you come. See no chambermaid, receive no hairdresser. 
not open my eyes before you are with me. Then let him come. But you must throw yourself at his head, dear. Have you got the house number? 376. But be quick. Lulu calls into the dining room. Ready, my darling? Rodrigo, entering. The ladies will pardon my mouth being full. Geschwitz, seizing his hand. I implore you, have mercy on my need. A la bonheur, let us mount the scaffold. Offers her his arm. Good night, children. Accompanies them into the corridor, then quickly returns with Bob. Quick, quick, Bob, we must get away this moment. You escort me, but we must change clothes. As the gracious lady bids. Oh, what gracious lady! You give me your clothes and put on mine. Come. Exeunt into the dining-room. Noise in the card-room. The doors are torn open, and Punchu, Halman, Alva, Bianetta, Magalona, Cadidia, and Ludmida enter, Halman holding a piece of paper with a glowing alpine peak at its top. Halman to Punchu. Will you accept the share of Jungfraustock, sir? But that paper has no exchange, my friend. You rascal! You just don't want to give me my revenge. Magalona to Bianetta. Have you any idea what it's all about? Punchu has taken all his money from him, and now gives up the game. Now he's got cold feet, the filthy Jew. How have I given up the game? How have I got cold feet? The gentleman has merely to lay plain cash. Is this my banking office I'm in? He can proffer me his trash tomorrow morning. Trash, you call that? The stock in my knowledge is at two hundred and ten. Yesterday it was at two ten, you're right. Today it's just nowhere. And tomorrow you'll find nothing cheaper or more tasteful to paper your stairs with. But how is that possible? Then we would be down and out. Well, what am I to say, who have lost my whole fortune in it? Tomorrow morning I shall have the pleasure of taking up the struggle for an assured existence for the thirty-sixth time. Magalona, passing forward. Am I dreaming, or do I really hear the Jungfrau stock has fallen? Fallen even lower than you, though you can use them for curl paper. Oh, God in heaven! Ten years' work! Falls in a faint. Wake up, Mama! Wake up! Say, Mr. Punchu, where will you eat this evening, since you've lost your whole fortune? Wherever you like, young lady. Take me where you will, but quickly. Here it's getting frightful. Exeunt Punchu and Bianetta. Halman, squeezing up his stock and flinging it to the ground. That is what one gets from this pack. Why do you speculate on the Jungfrau, too? Send a few little notices on the company to the German police here, and then you'll still win something in the end. I have never tried that in my life. But if you want to help me— Let's go to an all-night restaurant. Do you know the five-footed calf? I am very sorry. Or the sucking lamb? Or the smoking dog? They're all right near here. We'll be all by ourselves there. And before dawn we'll have a little article ready. Don't you sleep? Oh, of course. But not at night. Exeunt Halman and Ludmilla. Alva, who has been trying to resuscitate Magalona. Oh, ice-cold hands. Oh, what a splendid woman. We must undo her waist. Come, Kadidia. Uh, undo your mother's waist. She, she's so fearfully tight-laced. Kadidia, without stirring. I'm afraid. Lulu enters lower left in a jockey cap, red jacket, white leather breeches and riding boots, a riding cape over her shoulders. Have you any cash, Alva? Alva, looking up. Have you gone crazy? In two minutes the police'll be here. We are denounced. You can stay, of course, if you're eager to. Alva, springing up. Merciful heaven! Exeunt Alva and Lulu. Kadidia, shaking her mother in tears. Mama, Mama, wake up! They've all run away! Magalona, coming to herself. And youth gone. 
and my best days gone. Oh, this life! But I'm young, Mamma. Why shouldn't I earn any money? I don't want to go back to the convent. Please, Mamma, keep me with you. God bless you, sweetheart. You don't know what you say. Oh, no. I shall look around for an engagement in a varieté and sing the people my misfortunes with the Jungfraustock. Things like that are always applauded. But you've got no voice, Mamma. Ah, uh, yes, that's true. Take me with you to the variette. No, it would break my heart. But, well, if it can't be otherwise, and you're so made for it, I can't change things. Yes, we can go to the Olympia together tomorrow. Oh, Mamma, how glad that makes me feel. A plain-clothes detective enters upper left. In the name of the law, I arrest you. Casti Piani following him bored what sort of nonsense is that that isn't the right one curtain end of act two act three of lulu two pandora's box by frank Vedekind. Translated by Samuel Atkins Elliot, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three. An attic room without windows, but with two skylights, under one of which stands a bowl filled with rainwater. Downright a door through a board partition into a sort of cubicle under the slanting roof. Near it a wobbly flower-table with a bottle and a smoking oil-lamp on it. Upper right a worn-out couch. Door center. Near it a chair without a seat. Down left below the entrance door a torn gray mattress. None of the doors can shut tight. The rain beats on the roof. Shigolch in a long gray overcoat lies on the mattress, Alva on the couch, wrapped in a plaid whose straps still hang on the wall above him. The rain's drumming for the parade. Cheerful weather for her first appearance. I dreamt just now that we were dining together at Olympia. Bianetta was still with us. The tablecloth was dripping on all four sides with champagne. Yeah, yeah, and I was dreaming of a Christmas pudding. Lulu appears, back, barefoot in a torn black dress, but with her hair falling to her shoulders. Where have you been? Curling your hair first? She only does that to revive old memories. If one could only get warmed, just a little, from one of you. Will you enter barefoot on your pilgrimage? The first step always costs all kind of moaning and groaning. Twenty years ago it was no whit better, and what she has learned since then the coals only have to be blown. When she's been at it a week, not ten locomotives will hold her in our miserable attic. The bowl is running over. What shall I do with the water? Uh, pour it out the window. Lulu gets up on the chair and empties the bowl through the skylight. It looks as if the rain would let up at last. You're wasting your time when the clerks go home after supper. Would to God I were lying somewhere where no step would wake me any more. Oh, what I were to. Why prolong this life? Let's rather starve to death, together, this very evening, in peace and concord. Is it not the last stage now? Why don't you go out and get us something to eat? You've never earned a penny in your whole life. In this weather? when no one would kick a dog from his door. But me, I, with the little blood I have left in my limbs, I am to stop your mouths. I don't touch a farthing of the money. Let her go, just. I long for one more Christmas pudding. Then I've had enough. And I long for one more beefsteak and a cigarette. Then die. I was just dreaming of a cigarette 
such as never yet been smoked she'll see us put to an end before her eyes before doing herself a little pleasure the people on the street will sooner leave cloak and coat in my hands than go with me for nothing if you hadn't sold my clothes i at least wouldn't need to be afraid of the lamplight i'd like to see the woman who could earn anything in the rags i'm wearing on my body i have left nothing human untried as long as i had money i spent whole nights making up tables with which one couldn't help winning against the cleverest card sharps and yet evening after evening i lost more than if i had shaken out gold by the pailful then i offered my services to the courtesans but they don't take anyone without the stamps of the courts and they see at first glance if one's related to the guillotine or not yeah yeah i spared myself no disillusionments but when i made jokes they laughed at me and when i behaved as respectable as i am they boxed my ears and when i tried being smutty they got so chaste and maidenly that my hair stood up on my head for horror he who has not prevailed over society they have no confidence in won't you kindly put your boots on now child i don't think i shall grow much older in this lodging it's months since i had any feeling in the ends of my toes towards midnight i'll drink a bit more down the pub the lady that keeps it told me yesterday that i seem to really want to be her lover in the name of the three devils i'll go down she puts to her mouth the bottle on the flower table so they can smell your stink a half hour off i shan't drink it all you won't go down you're my woman you shan't go down i forbid it what would you forbid your woman when you can't support yourself whose fault is that who but my woman has laid me on the sick bed am i sick who has trailed me through the dung who has made me my father's murderer did you shoot him he didn't lose much but when i see you lying there i could hack off both my hands for having sinned so against my judgment she goes out into her room she infected me from her castipiani it's a long time since she was susceptible to it herself little devils like her can't begin putting up with it too soon if angels are ever going to come out of them oh, she ought to have been born empress of russia then she'd have been in the right place a second catherine the second lulu re-enters with a worn-out pair of boots and sits on the floor to put them on if only i don't go head first down the stairs Ugh! how cold is there anything in the world more dismal than a daughter of joy patience patience she's only got to take the right road into the business at the start it's all right with me nothing's wrong with me any more puts the bottle to her lips that warms one oh accursed exit when we hear her coming we must creep into my cubby hole a while i'm damned sorry for her when i think back i grew up with her in a way you know she'll hold out as long as i live anyway we treated each other at first like brother and sister mamma was still living then i met her by chance one morning when she was dressing dr goal had been called for a consultation her hairdresser had read my first poem that i had printed in society follow thy pack far over the mountains it will return again covered with sweat and dust oh yeah and then she came in rose-colored muslin with nothing under it but a white satin slip uh, for the spanish ambassador's ball oh, 
Dr. Gold seemed to feel his death near. He asked me to dance with her, so she shouldn't cause any mad acts. Papa, meanwhile, never turned his eyes from us. And all through the waltz she was looking over my shoulder, only at him. Afterwards, she shot him. It is unbelievable. I've only got a very strong doubt whether anyone will bite any more. I shouldn't like to advise it to anybody. Shigoch grunts. At that time, though she was a fully developed woman, she had the expression of a five-year-old, a joyous, utterly healthy child. And she was only three years younger than me then. But how long ago it is now. For all her immense superiorities in matters of practical life, she let me explain Tristan and Isolde to her, and how entrancingly she could listen. Out of the little sister who at her marriage still felt like a schoolgirl came the unhappy, hysterical artist wife. Out of the artist wife came the spouse of my blessed father. And out of her came then my mistress. Well, so that is the way of the world. Who will prevail against it? If only she doesn't skid away from the gentleman with honourable intentions, and bring us up instead some vagabond she's exchanged her heart secrets with. I kissed her for the first time in her rustling bridal dress. But afterwards, she didn't remember it. All the same, I believe she had thought of me, even in my father's arms. It can't have been often with him. He had his best time behind him. And she had deceived him with coachman and bootblack. But when she did give herself to him, then I stood before her soul. Through that, too, without my realizing it, she had attained this dreadful power over me. There they are. Heavy steps are heard mounting the stairs. Alva starting up. I will not endure it. I'll throw the fellow out. Shigal wearily picks himself up, takes Alva by the collar, and cuffs him toward the left. Forward, forward. How is the young man to confess his troubles to her with us two sprawling around? But if he demands other things, low things, of her. If, well, if. What more will he demand of her? He's only a man like the rest of us. We must leave the door open. Shigoch pushing Alva in, right. Nonsense. Lie down. I'll hear it soon enough. Heaven spare him. Shigoch closing the door from inside. Shut up. He'd better look out. Lulu enters, followed by Hunide, a gigantic figure with a smooth-shaven rosy face, sky-blue eyes, and a friendly smile. He wears a tall hat and overcoat and carries a dripping umbrella. Here's where I live. Hunide puts his finger to his lips and looks at Lulu significantly. Then he opens his umbrella and puts it on the floor, rear, to dry. Of course, I know it isn't very comfortable here. Hunide comes forward and puts his hand over her mouth. What do you mean me to understand by that? Hunide puts his hand over her mouth and his finger to his lips. I don't know what that means. Hunide quickly stops her mouth. Lulu frees herself. We're quite alone here. No one will hear us. Hunide lays his finger on his lips, shakes his head, points at Lulu, opens his mouth as if to speak, points at himself and then at the door. Ergot! He's a monster! 
Hunide stops her mouth, then goes rear, folds up his overcoat, and lays it over the chair near the door, then comes down with a broad smile, takes Lulu's head in both his hands, and kisses her on the forehead. The door, right, half opens. Shigoch, behind the door. He's got a screw loose. He'd better look out. She couldn't have brought up anything drearier. Lulu, stepping back. I hope you're going to give me something. Hunide stops her mouth and presses a gold piece in her hand, then looks at her uncertain, questioningly, as she examines it and throws it from one hand to the other. All right. It's good. Puts it into her pocket. Hunide quickly stops her mouth, gives her a few silver coins, and glances at her commandingly. Oh, that's nice of you. Hunide leaps madly about the room, brandishing his arms and staring upward in despair. Lulu cautiously nears him, throws an arm round him and kisses him on the mouth. Laughing soundlessly, he frees himself from her and looks questioningly. She takes up the lamp and opens the door to her room. He goes in smiling, taking off his hat. The stage is dark save for what light comes through the cracks of the door. Alva and Shigoch creep out on all fours. They're gone! Shigoch behind him. Wait! One can never hear nothing here. You've heard that often enough. I will kneel before her door. Little mother Sonny. Presses past Alva, gropes across the stage to Hunade's coat, and searches the pockets. Alva crawls to Lulu's door. Gloves, nothing more. Turns the coat round, searches the inside pockets, pulls out a book that he gives to Alva. Just see what that is. Alva holds the book to the light. Wearily deciphering the title page. Warnings to pious pilgrims and such as wish to be so. Oh, very helpful. Price, two shillings and sixpence. It looks to me as if God had left him pretty completely. Lays the coat over the chair again and makes for the cubbyhole. There's nothing doing with these people. The country's best time's behind it. Life is never as bad as it's painted. He too creeps back. Not even a silk muffler he's got, and yet in Germany we creep on our bellies before this rabble. Come, let's vanish again. She only thinks of herself, and takes the first man that runs across her path. I hope the dog remembers her the rest of his life. They disappear left, shutting the door behind them. Lulu re-enters, setting the lamp on the table. Hunide follows. Will you come to see me again? Hunide stops her mouth. She looks upward in a sort of despair and shakes her head. Hunide, putting his coat on, approaches her, grinning. She throws her arms around his neck. He gently frees himself, kisses her hand, and turns to the door. She starts to accompany him, but he signs to her to stay behind, and noiselessly leaves the room. Shigoch and Alva re-enter. How he has stirred me up! How much did he give you? Here it is! All! Take it! I'm going down again. We can still live like princes up here. He's coming back. Then let's just retire again. Quick! He's after his prayer book. Here it is. It must have fallen out of his coat. Lulu, listening. No, that isn't he. That's someone else. Someone's coming up. I hear it quite plainly. Now there's someone tapping at the door. Who may that be? Probably a good friend he's recommended to us. Come in. Countess Geschwitz enters in poor clothes, with a canvas roll in her hand. Geschwitz to Lulu. If I've come at a bad time, I'll turn around again. The truth is, I haven't spoken to a living soul for ten days. I must tell you right off, I haven't got any money. My brother never answered me at all. Your ladyship would now like to stretch your feet under our table? I'm going down again. Where are you going in this pomp? However, I come not wholly empty-handed. I bring you something else. On my way here, 
an old clothes man offered me twelve shillings for it but i could not force myself to part from it you can sell it though if you want to what is it let us see it takes the canvas and unrolls it visibly rejoiced oh by god it's lulu's portrait monster you brought that here get it out of my sight throw it out of the window alva suddenly with renewed life deeply pleased why i should like to know looking at this picture i again regain my self-respect it makes my fate comprehensible to me everything we have endured gets clear as day in a somewhat elegiac strain let him who feels secure in his middle-class position when he sees these blossoming pouting lips these childlike eyes big and innocent this rose-white body abounding in life let him cast the first stone at us we must nail it up it will make an excellent impression on our patrons there's a nail sticking all ready for it in the wall but how did you come upon this acquisition i secretly cut it out of the wall in your house there after you were gone too bad the colors all rubbed off around the edges you didn't roll it up carefully enough fastens it to a high nail in the wall it's got to have another one underneath if it's going to hold it makes the whole flat look more elegant let me alone i know how i'll do it he tears several nails out of the wall pulls off his left boot and with its heel nails the edges to the picture to the wall it's just got to hang a while again to get its proper effect whoever looks at that will imagine afterwards that he's been in an indian harem alva putting on his boot again standing up proudly her body was at its highest point of development when that picture was painted the lamp kid dear seems to me it's gotten extraordinarily dark he must have been an eminently gifted artist who painted that lulu perfectly composed again stepping before the picture with the lamp didn't you know him then no it must have been long before my time i only occasionally heard chance remarks of yours that he had cut his throat from persecution mania alva comparing the picture with lulu the childlike expression in her eyes is still absolutely the same in spite of all she has lived through since the dewy freshness that covered her skin the sweet-smelling breath from her lips the rays of light that beam from her white forehead and this challenging splendor of young flesh and throat and arms all that's gone with the rubbish wagon she can say with self-assurance that was me once the man she falls into the hands of to-day will have no conception of what we were when we were young oh god be thanked we don't notice the continual decline when she was a person all the time the woman blooms for us in the moment when she hurls the man to destruction for the rest of his life that is her name and her destiny down in the street lamps shimmer she's still a match for a dozen walking spectres the man who still wants to make connections at this hour looks out more for art qualities than mere physical good points he decides for a pair of eyes from which the least thievery sparkles lulu now as pleased as alva I shall see if you are right. Adieu. You shall not go down again, as I live. Where did you want to go? Down to fetch up a man. Lulu. She's done it once today already. Lulu, Lulu, where you go, I go too. If you want to put your bones up for sale, kindly get a district of your own. Lulu, 
I shall not stir from your side. I have weapons upon me. Confound it all. Her ladyship plots to fish with our bait. You're killing me. I can't stand it here any more. Exit. You need fear nothing. I am with you. Follows her. Alva, whimpering, throws himself on his couch. Shigoch swears loudly and grumbling. Oh, I, I guess there's not much more good to expect on this side. We ought to have held the creature back by the throat. She'll scare away everything that breathes with her aristocratic death's head. She's flung me onto a sick bed and larded me with thorns outside and in and she's still got enough strength in her body to do the same for ten men all right no mortally wounded man'll ever find the stab of mercy welcomer than i if she hadn't enticed the acrobat to my place that time we'd have him around our neck to-day too I see it swinging above my head, as Tantalus saw the branch with the golden apples. Shigoch on his mattress. Won't you turn up the lamp a little? Can a simple, natural man in the wilderness suffer so unspeakably? What have I made of my life? What's the beastly weather made of my ulster? When I was five and twenty, I knew how to help myself. It has cost everyone my sunny, glorious youth. I guess it'll go out in a minute. Till they come back, it'll be as dark in here again as in mother's womb. With the clearest consciousness of my purpose. I... I sought intercourse with people who'd never read a book in their lives. <laughs> with self-denial, with exultation, I clung to the elements that I might be carried to the loftiest heights of poetic fame. The reckoning was false. I am the martyr of my calling since the death of my father i have not written a single line if only they haven't stayed together nobody but a silly boy will go with two no matter what they've not stayed together that's what i hope if need be she'll keep the creature off her with her kicks one risen from the dregs is the most celebrated man of his nation another born in the purple lies in the mud and cannot die here they come and what blessed hours of mutual joy in creation they had lived through each other they can do that now for the first time rightly we must hide again i stay here just what do you pity them for who spends his money has his good reasons for it i have no longer the moral courage to let my comfort be disturbed for a miserable sum of money he wraps himself up in his plaid noblesse oblige a respectable man does what he owes his position he hides left lulu opens the door saying Come right in, dearie. And there enters Prince Kongu Poti, heir apparent of Uahubi, in a light suit, white spats, tan button boots, and a grey tall hat. His speech, interrupted with frequent hiccups, abounds with the peculiar African hiss sounds. God damn! It's dark on the stairs. It's lighter here, sweetheart. Pulling him forward by the hand. Come on. But it's cold here, awful cold. Have some brandy. Brandy? You bet. Always. Brandy's good. Lulu giving him the bottle. I don't know where there's a glass. Doesn't matter. Drinks. Brandy. Lots of it. You're a nice-looking young man. 
My father's the emperor of Uahubi. I've got six wives here, to Spanish, to English, to French. Well, I don't like my wives. Always I must take a bath, take a bath, take a bath. How much will you give me? Gold. Trust me, you shall have gold. One gold piece. I always give gold pieces. You can give it to me later, but show it to me. I never pay beforehand. But you can show it to me, though. Don't understand, don't understand. Come, Ragapsi Mulara. Seizing Lulu round the waist. Come on. Lulu defending herself with all her strength. Let me be, let me be. Alvar, who has risen painfully from his couch, sneaks up to Kangu Poti from behind and pulls him back by the collar. Kangu Poti whirling round. Uh oh, this is a murder hole. Come, my friend, I'll put you to sleep. Strikes him over the head with a loaded cane. Alva groans and falls in a heap. Here's a sleeping draught. Here's opium for you. Sweet dreams to you, sweet dreams. Then he gives Lulu a kiss, pointing to Alva. He dreams of you, Ragapsishimulara. Sweet dreams. Rushing to the door. Here's the door. Exit. But I'll not stay here. Who can stand it here now? Rather down onto the street. Exit. Shigoch comes out. Blood. Alva. He's got to be put away somewhere. Hop. Or else our friends will get a shock from him. Alva. Alva. He that isn't quite clear about it. One thing or t'other, it'll soon be too late. I'll give him legs. Strikes a match and sticks it into Alva's collar. He will have his rest, but no one sleeps here. Drags him by the head into Lulu's room. Returning, he tries to turn up the light. It'll be time for me too right soon now, or they'll get no more Christmas puddings down there in the tavern. God knows when she'll be coming back from her pleasure tour. Fixing an eye on Lulu's picture. She doesn't understand business. She can't live off love, because her life is love. There she comes. I'll just talk straight to her once. Countess Geschwitz enters. If you want to lodge with us tonight, kindly take a little care that nothing is stolen here. How dark it is here. It gets much darker than this. The doctor's already gone to rest. She sent me ahead. That was sensible. If anyone asks for me, I'm sitting downstairs in the pub. Geschwitz, after he is gone. I will sit behind the door. I will look on at everything and not quiver an eyelash. Sits on the broken chair. Men and women don't know themselves. They know not what they are. Only one who is neither man nor woman knows them. Every word they say is untrue, a lie. And they do not know it, for they are today so and tomorrow so according as they have eaten, drunk, and loved or not. Only a body remains for a time what it is, and, and only the children have reason. The men and women are like animals. None knows what it does. When they are happiest, they bewail themselves and groan, and in their deepest misery they rejoice over every tiny morsel. It is strange how hunger takes from men and women the strength to withstand misfortune. But when they have fed full, they make this world a torture chamber. They throw away their lives to satisfy a whim, a mood. Have there ever once been men and women to whom love brought happiness? And what is their happiness, save that they sleep better and can forget it all? My God, I thank thee that thou hast not made me as these. I am not man nor woman. My body has nothing common with their bodies. Have I a human soul? Tortured humanity has a little narrow heart. But I know I deserve nothing when I resign all, sacrifice all. Lulu opens the door and Dr. Hilty enters. Geschwitz, unnoticed, remains motionless by the door. Come right in. 
Come, you'll stay with me all night. But I have no more than five shillings on me. I never take more than that when I go out. That's enough, because it's you. You have such faithful eyes. Come, give me a kiss. Dr. Hilty begins to swear in the broadest North Country vowels. Please don't say that. By the devil, it is the first time I ever gone with a girl. You can believe me, Mas. I hadn't thought it would be like this. Are you married? Heaven and hell! Why do you think I am married? No, I am a tutor. I read philosophy at the university. The truth is, I come of a very old country family. As a student, I got just two shillings pocket money, and I could make better use of that than for girls. So you have never been with a woman? Just so, yes. But I want it now. I got engaged this evening to a country woman of mine. She is a governess here. Is she pretty? Yeah. She's got a hundred thousand. I'm very eager, as it seems to me. Lulu tossing back her hair. I am in luck. Takes the lamp. Well, if you please, Mister Tudor. They go into her room. Geschwitz draws a small black revolver from her pocket and sets it to her forehead. Come, come, beloved. Dr. Hilty tears open the door again. Dr. Hilty plunging in. Insane, Sarabs! Someone's lying in there! Lulu, lamp in hand, holds him by the sleeve. Stay with me! A dead man? A corpse? Stay with me! Stay with me! Dr. Hilty tearing away. A corpse is lying in there. Horrors! Hail! Heaven! Stay with me! Where does it go out? Sees Geschwitz. And that is the devil. Please, stop! Stay! Devil, devil, devilry! Oh, though eternal! Exit. Lulu rushing after him. Stop! Stop! Geschwitz alone lets the revolver sink. Better hang. If she sees me lie in my blood to-day, she'll not weep a tear for me. I have always been to her but the docile tool that could be used for the heaviest labour. From the first day she has abhorred me from the depths of her soul. Shall I not rather jump from the bridge? Which could be colder, the water or her heart? I would dream till I was drowned. Better hang. Stab? Hmm. There would be no use in that. How often have I dreamt that she kissed me? But a minute more, and the owl knocked there at the window, and I wake up. Better hang. Not water. Water is too clean for me. Starting up. There, there it is. Quick now, before she comes. Takes the plaid straps from the wall, climbs on the chair, fastens them to a hook in the doorpost, puts her head through them, kicks the chair away, and falls to the ground. A cursed life, a cursed life. Could it be before me still? Let me speak just once to thy heart, my angel. But thou art cold. I am not to go yet. Perhaps I am even to have been happy once. Listen to him, Lulu. I am not to go yet. She drags herself before Lulu's picture, sinks to her knees, and folds her hands. My adored angel, my love, my star, have mercy upon me. Pity me, pity me, pity me. Lulu opens the door, and Jack enters, a thick-set man of elastic movements with a pale face, inflamed eyes, arched and heavy brows, a drooping moustache, thin imperial and shaggy whiskers, and fiery red hands with gnawed nails. His eyes are fixed on the ground. He wears a dark overcoat and a little round felt hat. Entering, he notices Geschwitz. Who is that? That's my sister. She's crazy. I don't know how to get rid of her. Your mouth looks beautiful. It's my mother's. Looks like it. How much do you want? I haven't got much money. Won't you spend the night with me here? 
No, I haven't got the time. I must get home. You must tell them at home tomorrow that you missed the last bus and spent the night with a friend. How much do you want? I'm not after lumps of gold, but, well, a little something. Jack, turning. Good night, good night. Lulu holds him back. No, no, stay, for God's sake. Jack goes past Geschwitz and opens the cubicle. Why should I stay here till morning? Sounds suspicious. When I'm asleep, they'll turn my pockets out. No, I won't do that. No one will. Don't go away again for that. I beg you. How much do you want? Then give me the half of what I said. No, that's too much. You don't seem to have been at this long. Today is the first time. She jerks back Geschwitz, on her knees still, half turned toward Jack, by the straps around her neck. Lie down and be quiet. Let her alone. She isn't your sister. She is in love with you. Strokes Geschwitz's head like a dog's. Poor beast. Why do you stare at me so, all at once? I got your measure by the way you walked. I said to myself, that girl must have a well-built body. How can you see things like that? I even saw that you had a pretty mouth, but I've only got a floor in on me. Well, what difference does that make? Just give that to me. But you'll have to give me half back, so I can take the bus tomorrow morning. I have nothing on me. Just look, though. Hunt through your pockets. Well, what's that? Let's see it. Lulu, showing him. That's all I have. Give it to me. I'll change it tomorrow, and then give you half. No, give it all to me. Lulu, giving it. In God's name! But now you come. Takes up the lamp. We need no light. The moon's out. Lulu puts the lamp down. As you say. She falls on his neck. I won't harm you at all. I love you so. Don't let me beg you any longer. All right. I'm with you. Follows her into the cubbyhole. The lamp goes out. On the floor under the two skylights appear two vivid squares of moonlight. Everything in the room is clearly seen. Geschwitz as in a dream. This is the last evening I shall spend with these people. I'm going back to Germany. My mother will send me the money. I'll go to a university. I must fight for women's rights. Study law. Lulu shrieks and tears open the door. Lulu, barefoot, in chemise and petticoat, holding the door shut behind her. Help! Geschwitz rushes to the door, draws her revolver, and pushing Lulu aside, aims it at the door. As Lulu again cries, Help! Let go! Jack, bent double, tears open the door from inside, and runs a knife into Geschwitz's body. She fires one shot at the roof and falls with suppressed crying, crumpling up. Jack tears her revolver from her and throws himself against the exit door. God damn! I never saw a prettier mouth. Sweat drips from his hairy face. His hands are bloody. He pants, gasping violently, and stares at the floor with eyes popping out of his head. Lulu, trembling in every limb, looks wildly round. Suddenly she seizes the bottle, smashes it on the table, and with the broken neck in her hand rushes upon Jack. He swings up his right foot and throws her onto her back. Then he lifts her up. No! No! Mercy! Murder! Police! Police! Be still. You'll never get away from me again. Carries her in. Lulu, within, right. No! 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 Ah! Ah! After a pause, Jack re-enters. He puts the bowl on the table. Mm, that was a piece of work. Washing his hands. I am a damned lucky chap. Looks round for a towel. Not even a towel, these folks here. Hell of a wretched hole. He dries his hands on Geschwitz's petticoat. This invert is safe enough from me. To her. It'll soon be all up with you, too. Exit. Geschwitz, alone. Lulu. My angel. Let me see thee once more. I am near thee. Stay near thee. Forever. 
Her elbows give way. Oh, cursed! Dies. Curtain. End of Act Three. End of Lulu Two, Pandora's Box, by Frank Vedekind. Translated by Samuel Atkins Elliott, Jr.